For usual living on the shelves for educational purposes only and is not intended as financial advice. It is set up Sunday. Let's take a look at some charts here. The general landscape for me on the crypto side, definitely a little bit more confusing than the legacy side, which in the moment to me looks increasingly bearish, leaning very bearish. That isn't to say that crypto can't lean bearish. It's just on the Bitcoin side specifically, we of course are going to sell off on the weekend more than everything else because everything else is closed. So if there's some geopolitical news, the world is melting, Bitcoin's melting with it. With futures opening up today, that's certainly encouraging. We'll see what tomorrow brings for legacy, but I can't imagine going forward, things would be more bullish than bearish for legacy. Chopper down seems very likely to me. I'll take a look at some of those charts. Last week, we had a hot CPI print come in, which means cutting rates becomes less obvious. And when the rate expectations remain higher for longer, the market starts to price that in. Now, the interesting thing here is, of course, at the beginning of the year, everybody thought we'd get six cuts. Now, everybody thinks we'll get maybe two. And maybe, just maybe, that's what it took to actually flip because, you know, the wisdom of the crowd is usually wrong. So maybe we actually do get three cuts this year. I don't know. I don't see a justification for it based on the numbers, but Powell may have a different rationale based on PCE or something. We've got tax season, of course. Tax day in the U.S. is tomorrow. And myself, along with many other people, are shuffling money around and, in a way, pulling money out of crypto Liquidity is coming out of crypto. Liquidity is coming out of risk assets, at least temporarily. So liquidity broadly is down. And then, of course, the geopolitical angle. So all of these headwinds are blowing at us this week. Dollar up, gold up, oil up, bond yields up. And as bond yields rise, it makes risk on less obvious. As yields rise, it just makes more sense for an increasingly larger part of the investing community to participate in those yields. So it just means it's harder for the riskiest of the risky stuff to remain higher for longer. On the crypto side, we of course have Bitcoin having this week. Having the date has never really meant too much. It's always been more important weeks to months later. So I wouldn't expect any you know, amazing bullish move just because of having my preference is always to wash everybody out, and we certainly did that with the alts over the past couple of days. Maybe that continues with the miners slowly here over the next couple of months. I don't know, but certainly an important day uh, for Bitcoin historically. Always a fun little event that gets a lot of headlines, gets people talking about Bitcoin and understanding that this is programmatic. This isn't like, oh, are they going to raise or aren't they going to raise? It's We know exactly what the protocol is going to do before it does it because it's based on math. The ETF inflows is what this should say. Uh, are weak, have been weak for the past couple of weeks. Good news is we still have more capital coming in eventually via warehouses, potential Hong Kong ETFs. I talked about that in a video yesterday. And we've also got 13F filings, which reveal which companies or institutions are owning the ETFs. Nobody wants to be first, nobody wants to be last. So it certainly helps that these 13F filings are coming out and it's going to get more attention from more people. Technicals for Bitcoin. I got a lot of charts for Bitcoin. We'll talk about that. It's kind of all over the place. I don't have a great read on the decision tree here. It, you know, it's a gnarled mass. It's a bush. It's got termites. It's got carpenter ants. It's got uh, morel mushrooms growing. It's, it's got, it's got, uh, everything. You know, this, this decision tree has just about everything you can imagine still. And alts are just, uh, what do you say? Really down, I don't know, 50% in two days or something. Some of the meme or meme coins, plus minus 50% in a day. I don't know. It continues to not make sense to hold on to alts until after having and until realistically after after having, as in 60 days after having, is typically when alts start to do better at the very least. So we'll see, but it doesn't look too great on the alt front. As far as the ETFs for Bitcoin, this is the weekly flow picture. And as you can see over the past really four weeks, which makes sense. Price has gone nowhere. The ETF flows aren't everything, but even though they aren't most of the volume, arguably, they certainly have a big impact on price and are their own little neat sentiment gauge for legacy. So clearly legacy, you know, the early adopters, it appears have gotten in and now we'll see who's next, whether or not they need price to go up or down, whether or not we're going to see 
significant inflows or outflows in this range? Are we going to see outflows if we break down? Are we going to see inflows if we break up, right? Stuff like that is things to think about and watch over the course of this week. It's not predictive. It's just, of course, like we want to see more inflows all the time, always. I think the most important thing here is if we do break 72 for whatever reason, we probably see significant flows and we probably break 72 because we see significant inflows. Another way we can potentially break up. I'm not counting on that. Again, it's, it's all over the place, right? <laughs> it's at this point, it's anybody's guess, but GBTC outflows are still rather significant and they still have a significant amount of AUM. So if we have continuous outflows for GBC, GBTC, it's certainly harder for the inflows to even matter a little bit. Uh, so for legacy, again, you know, we have, we have all of the risk off the four horsemen, you know, we have the DXY, the dollar index raging above multi-month highs above the daily cloud. We have oil, same thing, <laughs> above, above multi-month highs above the daily cloud. Arguably, this is starting to look parabolic on oil. And for all of these, you're starting to see TKC clamps form. I'm really less worried about what happens this week and more just concerned with what happens the, the rest of the quarter, because if the Middle East stuff gets worse, then all of the risk off sentiment can increase. And that's only going to add additional headwinds for Bitcoin, right? I mean, that's what it is. Gold, of course, moved up pretty significantly. Nice breakout there on the daily cloud. And it hit the range on the initial multi-year inverted head and shoulders, which fun, which is funny. You know, I don't have that on here, but it took four years to form the pattern and hit the target in about a month, the broader cup and handle, the decade long cup and handle, that's still on the table. But for gold, we may see a bunch of chop. And then for the 10 year yield, again, if bonds are up, yields keep rising, eventually we're going to run into trouble. Uh, last time we ran into trouble was at uh, 5%. So we're getting pretty close. And just based on the technicals for the 10 year yield, this is a uh, daily breakout for yield. So collectively, all of this does not bode well. For crypto as a whole and the energy piece specifically for uh, inflation, which would mean rates actually higher for longer, depending on which macro podcast you list on any given or you listen to on any given moment, they're going to tell you, I think rates are going to go up or I think rates are going to go down or I can't imagine a world in which rates go up, whatever. But it's anybody's guess still at this point. This is another part of the liquidity piece, reverse repo on the inverse axis on the white line here. Now, this whole thing is a massive chart crime, just to be clear, but as money is coming out of reverse repo, it's going into government debt. And most importantly, the money is not coming out of risk to buy government debt. Okay. So this was definitely a liquidity injection over the past year and change. The issue up here now is the reverse repo is almost completely empty. And what's going to happen next, right? Is QE going to start to kick in. They're going to have to kick in a different type of QE, QE by a different name, a QT taper, whatever, to keep assets where they are, or are they just going to let things potentially roll over, which to me looks more likely than not. But you can see the close relationship here between Bitcoin, the S&P, and the reverse repo drain. We've gone from almost 3 trillion to under 450 billion. So as this starts to slow down, that's all the more reason that we potentially have a near-term top on our hands, at least within the next couple of weeks here, between S&P and the Qs and semis and all that fun stuff. Looking at the technicals for SPY, it's not frankly bearish, right? We're still above the cloud. We're still above the key June. Everything looks hunky-dory from that front. I'm more concerned with the price action up here. Both of these, I would say, are variations on a potential head and shoulders reversal. Monday's going to be very important to see how does the market digest the weekend news. Does the weekend news get worse next week with a potential retaliation from Israel? You know, all this fun stuff. But this fat cloud for both SPY and QQQ are potential bearish downside targets that we may see if we roll over, right? This whole thing is a massive if this, then that. So if we get a bearish DK cross, if we break down, blah, 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 right? You know, it's not like this is an expectation at the moment. That may change throughout the week, but as I stand here, both of these could continue to chop. It's just 
they both to me look like they are leaning bearish. And if we look at the seasonality for S and P, the middle of April, kind of a lull. This is based on the past 20 years. Of course, the golden rule sell in May and go away because that is kind of chopped for two months. Then things tend to do better later in the summer. I just don't know realistically based on price action here how much gas we have left in the tank. If we look at some of the market leaders in the semi space, NVIDIA, SMCI, both these charts to me certainly don't look bullish. You, know, you let me know in the comments, right? I might be, I might just have bear goggles on today. But both of these to me, again, triple top, head and shoulders, whatever the SMCI chart especially looks very heavy to me. So whenever we consolidate after a big move like this, if it's not an obvious continuation pattern, or if it's not just chop, then I got to take pause and say, okay, I can't just assume that this is going to break north. Now, if SMCI breaks the right shoulder, if NVIDIA breaks 960, then maybe, right? Let's keep going, keep the party going, keep the music on. But as this stands here, again, this is not a bullish picture for either of these. They've kind of been the market leaders in a sense. So it's definitely worth uh, paying attention to them. And if we contrast that with XLE, the energy stuff and copper, or any pick your commodity, right? All of them are roofing, uh, aluminum, <laughs> you know, it doesn't matter as a rotation play, as a defensive play, whatever you want to think of that as both of these look much better to me than most of tech, certainly most of mag seven and definitely Nvidia SMCI. Before I talk about Bitcoin here, let me mention today's video sponsor, Kraken Pro. Kraken Pro is a complete overhaul of the Kraken trading experience with a one-stop shop for advanced and professional traders. Kraken Pro enables efficient trading execution across multiple markets with a UI that allows for unique optimization tailored to your trading style. You can check out Kraken Pro with the link in the description of this video. There was some excitement over the weekend on Pax G, which had quite the move. That's retraced substantially. One thing to always note when you're trading a market that's not really open, but open like Pax G, you know, the gold market wasn't open on Saturday when all the geopolitical news went hay haywire. And that was quite a move on Pax G. Some of that's liquidity issues. Some of that's just people panicking, right? I still think generally the move for gold versus Bitcoin is shifting from neutral into bearish or sorry, from bearish into neutral as we're in the daily cloud here. But broadly, the, the trend is still definitely not bullish, even though there was a bottomy type pattern there. Now you do have this, of course, to deal with, which would be a range low TK C clamp potentially, you know, all this stuff would take weeks, which is likely to play out. So you may see another W bottom here. You know, if we see Bitcoin drop substantially, gold is unlikely to drop as much. So that's where Pax G would gain against Bitcoin just as a potential uh, game theory on that one. So for BTC, this whole range, we've had just about every potential chart pattern you could imagine. Head and shoulders, inverted head and shoulders, cup and handle, ascending triangle, head and shoulders. And then towards the end here, we've gotten potential ascending triangle again versus equilateral triangle versus Bollinger Band squeeze, all this stuff, like literally everything, right? At this point, to me, it's starting to lean bearish, obviously, because it's broken below the diagonal. Support, it's starting to look more like a head and shoulders to me. The good news is we're still in the range. We're still above the yearly pivot. Bad news is, like I mentioned with legacy, those headwinds, liquidity issues, chop probably makes the most sense. Sideways nonsense probably makes the most sense. And much like I need the NVIDIA and SMCI and legacy bearishness to clear, you know, I can't get bullish on this basically until we're back at 74, 73, something like that, which would be a new high. So either we attempt a local high retest or we just chop around, reset all the moving averages again, and then have a move later on, potentially May at this point, April might be just lost completely, but all that would be fine. You know, again, we're not as bearish and as volatile as this feels. I don't think it really is that bearish. The biggest concern is obviously fulfilling the destiny of the bearish resolution on this triangle, just measuring from high to low, the fibs measure to the next pivot down, right? Even then, is 52.5 the end of the world? No, but if you're long at 65, then yeah, it's the end of the world for you. But for most people, it wouldn't really matter. Something else to pay attention to here, we've got a VPVR level at 67.3, also a VPVR level at 51.5, which would matches the target here. 
if we continue to break down. So if we lose the pivot, I like 52 and a half. If we can hold in this range, I feel better above 67.3. I feel best above 73. But ultimately, there's really nothing to do here. You know, it's all just mega turbo chop. And this is another way to mark up this price action. You've got a head and shoulders variant, King's Castle, as Peter Brandt would call it. And, uh, you know, it doesn't look bullish. Just doesn't. We had a bearish breakdown. Any chop below the right shoulder is still, in my eyes, considered resolving potentially bearish. And that's it, right? There's really no other way to slice this on the bullish side until we attempt another local high or something, right? Because we've broken down from all the triangles we could bro break down from. There's no, no other way to redraw this support, right, up here. So from a strict price action perspective, certainly not bullish. If we pop on a pitchfork here, pick three points, you get a rate of change. Midpoint is the magnet for price above pitchfork. You are overbought below. You have a risk of nullifying and validating a pitchfork. Also, realistically, above the pitchfork, you have a risk to the upside of invalidating a pitchfork. But once again, if we break down, there's a decent likelihood that we would just return to the midpoint of the pitchfork, which would be 57 ish. You know, again, it just, it's all kind of the same spot. 53 to 57, 52 and a half to 57, whatever. Doing nothing for two months and just drifting to the midpoint, also perfectly reasonable. Nothing wrong with that. If we go as simple as we can, the 5200 moving average on the daily, we're starting to lose the 50. Now we lost the 50 in February. We can certainly retake the 50 at a future date. It's not, you know, completely over over. We could argue, well, it was a weekend. It was low liquidity. People were panicking, you know, crypto being crypto. We can sort of rationalize away the bearishness, but realistically, again, I, I can't see this and think, oh man, this is just all so bullish. So we don't need to retest the 200. This could just take, again, two weeks, two months, I don't know, just take time to let these moving averages catch up with price, let the moving averages catch up with each other. And if we're lucky, let's say we don't do anything till June, July, for whatever reason, right? If we're lucky, we'll get something similar to September, November, where we had the easiest trade of your life and a 5200 bear to bull cross, and the rest is history. There just, once again, is not a clear path to bullishness here. The good news on the cloud, you know, it's take stock of a trend indicator like the cloud. We're still above the daily cloud. We double tapped the daily key June. We are likely to confirm potentially a tweezer bottom on the key June, which is just, uh, as you'd expect, you know, two wicks tightly similar in length with the second wick not exceeding the first wick. That's a tweezer bottom, okay? What we don't want from today's candle is any lower low, realistically below the body of yesterday's candle, and definitely not below the wick of yesterday's candle. And at this point, we may get a TK crisscross. Again, this is going to take two weeks at least, probably. But like we did in February, we kind of chopped around. We kind of did a bunch of nothing. We got another layup here with a chart pattern. And you can just see on the daily, as, as much of a slam dunk as this chart pattern was, this inverted head and shoulders, this one, again, is this thing is a monster up here to me. I just, I can't see this and, and feel bullish. So I would certainly prefer the TK cross, recross to happen before I do anything. Once again, bearish target through the cloud here. 55 and a half probably would be the bearish edge to edge move. Anything below the key June confirms that anything below the yearly pivot, you know, all this stuff sort of is saying the same thing in that we make lower lows and we probably go deeper down into the low fifties at that point. We can also use the Williams fractals for this. So how these work, high, low, high is support, low, high, low is resistance. So we breached a support fractal level with the Saturday candle for the second time in this range. The first was mid-March, and that kind of set off everything else in this range, in this chop. So once again, this is just telling you there's really no reason to be mega turbo long up here yet. In this case, the fractal is telling you anything above 73 or whatever. Again, you know, not like it's a surprise. We make higher highs, we're probably going higher. We make lower lows, we're probably going lower, but that's what you get when you have a range that looks like this. And again, anything below that wick, and you're breaking the support fractal. So 
all eyes on 62 for sure. And even if we go through the cloud to 55 or lower, it's not really over. We've done that several times in 2023. This was the SVB megaphone. This was head and shoulders into falling wedge with BlackRock ETF news. And we've definitely done a good job so far resetting open interest, resetting funding. That's all essential for keeping this thing going. This was uh, 2017. We had several breakdowns through the cloud. We had several TK crisscrosses. These took weeks to happen, right? These don't just happen overnight on the daily. Never a guarantee, never a promise, but are a very high hit rate signal when you see that on the daily. So we are a ways away from getting that signal. On the weekly cloud, we're also pretty far away from the key June, pretty far away from the 20 week moving average. That's not to say that this is bearish per se, but again, if we just sit here and do nothing, let the moving averages catch up with price, that's totally fine. It makes us less overbought on any subsequent further move to 80, for example. So it certainly feels like we're going uh, nowhere fast up here, and this remains bullish on the weekly by a long shot, even at down to 52, even down to 42. This is bullish on the weekly cloud. So it's going to be very hard to completely destroy this rally and reverse this trend, but I think it's going to be fairly easy to attempt a move to the mid 50s. Looking at ETH, looking at ETH BTC, I mean, lots and lots of alts look way worse than ETH. And you're getting a preview for potentially what's in store for Bitcoin here. You had a bearish TK cross price through the cloud. You didn't get a close below the cloud on the daily, but this is very much telling you neutral at best, bearish at worst, and definitely not telling you the trend is bullish. For the next two weeks, over the next month, you will see very likely cloud potentially flip from bullish to bearish and or price back above cloud with a bullish TK cross, right? You can always buy the knife. Nothing says you can't, but trend is telling you that we have reset everything. You know, and if I had Williams Fractals on here, we had a Williams Fractal breach at 38 where I sold all my ETH that I had other than what I needed for transactions. So there was plenty of opportunity to get out of alts for like a month now. And ETH BTC just continues to make new multi-year lows. You know, there's really no support until 04 at this point. It doesn't need to do that quickly, but can't imagine the ETH ETF gets approved. I can't imagine that news is necessarily bullish. Hopefully we get a definitive stab down and that's something worth buying at that point. But up here, again, this is <laughs> extremely, extremely, extremely bearish still below the weekly cloud. Soul doesn't look as bad as ETH does from a bearish perspective, but it is in the daily cloud now and it is further in the daily cloud than it has been since the entire run. This run was up over a thousand percent in six months. So yeah. It can keep going. Nothing says it can't, but the probabilities and odds and the likelihood that this goes and turns a corner immediately is probably very unlikely. And much like all of the other charts I've been talking about, Seoul had this inverted Adam and Eve double top that I mentioned last week. And it doesn't really matter if that breaks down. It's just, it needs to do something before I care about it, right? So this is starting to look more bearish like it should. And that's a good thing. We've resolved the, the double top. And once again, like the ETH chart, we will eventually see trend likely flip back and forth, maybe price below cloud. I don't know. It doesn't really matter to me at this point. But something you don't want to miss is the next breakout above the cloud, the next bullish TK cross. Those are all things to watch for. Lastly here, on the alt ETE setups I've been talking about, all those for the most part, broke down pretty considerably. A lot of people always ask me like, you know, where's my stop loss on any of this stuff? You certainly don't want to see any new lower lows. Mana, for example, risk, risking a lower low, AXS risking a lower low. All of these are sort of out of the cloud, file coins still in the cloud, but breaking down below the cloud, certainly not bullish. Making new lower lows, certainly not bullish. None of these are new multi-month lows, right? So there's a silver lining there. All of these could form some sort of triple bottom inverted head and shoulders, right? It's just, it, this is going to take time. This is going to take lots of time. 
I think the next move, like last Q4, is going to be in Q4. I think that's when alts are going to do best. I think that's when rates come down. I think that's when the liquidity picture may look better because we have some sort of event that makes the Fed inject liquidity, whatever, right? But if I was piling into these now, which I certainly wouldn't, and I didn't, but one way to think about this in the long term, I wouldn't expect a miracle for several months at this point. You know, if it comes before Q4, consider that a blessing, but I think it's going to take time on top of time for anything that looks like this to recover. Now, I know some meme coins are already up 50% that were down 50% the day before, or whatever. You know, that's that's a different animal, but the alts from last cycle that are still at range lows are definitely going to take some time to recover here. So the, the TLDR is, uh, look, we've got a challenging legacy week ahead of us, probably a couple weeks ahead of us. Bitcoin marches on and the uh, long-term Bitcoin targets to me, 300K plus, totally fine. I, I have no issues with that. The answers to all this stuff is printing more money and they can't seem to stop spending. So Bitcoin goes up. That's all I have for this one. Like, dislike, comment, share, subscribe, and happy trading.